Hello, my name is Adam. This is the fifth and most likely last video in my series to learn how to make Super Mario Brothers in Unity. If you are looking to start from the beginning of the series, there is a link to the full playlist in the description of the video. This video in the series will focus on entering and exiting pipes, transitioning to the underground area, animating the flagpole and castle sequence, and finally loading the next level. If you need help at any point in the tutorial, feel free to join our Discord community where we can offer direct help. There is also a link in the description of the video. Please consider subscribing to the channel to support the amount of effort it takes to create a video like this one. It would mean a lot to me and it helps drive the growth of my channel. Thank you. Enjoy the video. All right, let's start by working on our pipes to allow Mario to be able to enter and exit them. First, we need to make a couple of changes to the prefabs themselves. Just a couple minor updates before we write our script. And we have two different pipe prefabs. One is our kind of our main vertical one. And then we also have the one that is used in the underground section. So let's just start with our main vertical pipe here. And all we really need to do is add a little trigger collider to the very top here to indicate where Mario needs to be standing in order to enter the pipe. Because in the code, we need to detect when Mario is colliding with the pipe in order to then enter it. But we specifically want him to be standing roughly in the center of the pipe when he enters, not any, not when he's touching anywhere on the pipe. So we're gonna add a little trigger collider to represent that area. So on the main parent object here, I'm gonna add a box collider 2D. Let's mark it as a trigger. That's really important because we don't actually want Mario to physically collide with this box. We just want to, tr to know when he's within that trigger zone i'm going to bump it up half a unit so it sits rough you know sits a little bit above the pipe and then i'm going to reduce the size as well to half a unit um, you can even go potentially smaller but the reason for this is we want mario to be standing roughly in the center let's say you had this as large as the pipe well then mario could stand on the very edge he'd be touching this trigger zone and which would allow him to enter and if he enters on the very edge that wouldn't look right so we make this pretty small to kind of force mario to have to stand roughly in the center of the pipe in order to enter you can maybe even go smaller here um, but from one from my testing this um, 0.5 seems to work pretty well so but feel free to adjust that if you feel like he's able to still um, enter too much on the sides. The other thing we want to do is change our layer on this parent object. And that's because some of our player movement code does ray cast to check for certain things, which then it affects Mario's movement. And this trigger zone will still be detected by ray casts, even though it's a trigger. So Mario won't physically collide with it, but the ray cast will still be picked up by, by it. So what we can do is actually just change the layer to ignore Raycast. And that's a built-in layer that Unity provides. And we don't want to change the children. We only want to change this parent object. So we're going to say, no, this object only. That's really important because we do still want the main collision and the Raycast to hit the, the main top and bottom of the pipe here. So make sure those are still on the default layer. But just the parent here will be ignore Raycast. That's it for now. Let's do the same thing for our other pipe as well. So we're gonna add a box collider 2D to this one. And if you position your pipes accordingly, when I first, when we first put these prefabs together, I think that was, was that in our very first video? That might've been in the very first video. But if you position them accordingly, the default origin should already be exactly where we want um, where we want it so it kind of keeps it simple make sure we mark this as a trigger i'm still going to reduce the size of this as well and i think we're good there oh same thing let's change the layer to ignore raycast only for the parent object so no this object only and i think we're good with our prefabs for now all right let's start writing our pipe script now in order to actually animate Mario entering the pipe and exiting. Let's create a new C-sharp script. I'm just gonna call this pipe. Let that reload, let's open this up. I'm going to delete the boilerplate that Unity provides for us here and kind of just start fresh. 
All right, so the first thing we want to do is detect when Mario has actually um, is actually standing within that little trigger zone we added. So we can add the function on trigger stay. So usually we use on trigger enter, but once Mario is standing in that little trigger zone, we need to check for input and we don't know which frame you're going to press the input. So we can't do enter because on trigger enter only gets called the one frame when you first enter on trigger stay will get called every single frame you are standing in the zone in that triggers area so that'll allow us to then properly check for input so on trigger stay 2d um, this takes collider 2d other the first thing we need to do is verify that this other object is Mario or is the player. So we're gonna say if other.compare tag is player, we know that this is Mario that's standing on the pipe and not something else. Uh, make sure that you have tagged Mario as the player. It already should be, but in case you haven't, if we go to Mario's prefab, he should be tagged as player. His layer is also player, but in this case, we care about the tag to be player. I think I actually saw some people in Discord um, forget to tag the player that they, they layered them, but they confused that with the tag and that caused some issues. So make sure double check that your Mario is tagged as player. All right, from here, we can check for input to know when we should actually enter the pipe, but the input varies based on the pipe itself because there are some pipes that might be vertical. So you might need to press down Whereas there's other pipes that are, for example, this one, you would press right in order to enter. So we need to define a variable to define what that key is you need to press to enter. So we can have a public variable here so we can edit it or change it in the editor. I'm gonna call this the enter key code. I'm gonna default this to S. I'm using W, A, S, and D as my control scheme. So S is down in my case. Um, so that will be the default since most most of the pipes are kind of the vertical ones that you enter going down but we can change this in the editor for some of the others that are more unique so here we can say if input dot get key um or and this really should be get key down maybe um enter key code Hello, future Adam here. I'm actually recording this while editing the video. I want to just interject real quick and state that you actually should use get key instead of get key down. Get key will actually make it a little bit more seamless when you're entering the pipes rather than get key down. So just a little fix there, a little update there. And then from here, we can actually start animating Mario. So they've pressed the key to enter the pipe. Now we can animate Mario, but before we do that, let's do a couple of things. We need to define some variables that we'll use for the animation. So one, we need to know which direction we're animating because once again, the pipes can vary. So in most cases, it will go down, but some pipes you might animate to the right. So we should have a enter direction and I'll default this to down. We should also have an exit direction. Now I'll default this to zero. So the exit direction will be used. Um, in some cases you enter pipe and maybe you exit out of another pipe, in which case the exit direction might be up, for example. But there are many cases where you enter a pipe and it just brings you to a fixed point, um, like the underground section, for example. You're, you, when you go to the underground, you're not falling out of a pipe, you just kind of um, appear in the underground. So that's where zero will come into play. Zero will be used to indicate that you're not um, you're not animating the exit. You're just going to a fixed point. Whereas if the exit direction is not zero, then we'll actually animate that. And then finally, we do need a variable to indicate where you're going to transport to when you um, come out of the pipe, or where like where does the pipe lead to? So where does it connect to? So I'm gonna maybe call this connection. And this is a transform. So we're referencing another transform in our world to indicate where the pipe leads to, where it connects to. Um, with that in mind, we want to, we should only allow Mario to enter a pipe that actually leads somewhere else. There are a lot of pipes you can't enter. And so if the connection is not null, 
then Mario can enter. But if the connection is null, well, you can't enter the pipe because it doesn't lead anywhere. We need to do a null check there, um, followed by the existing condition. All right, so we need to actually animate Mario now. Just like we've done in some of our other code, we should do, we're gonna do animation in a coroutine. So we need to import using system.collections, which will allow us to write, to define our coroutine function here, which has a return type of I enumerator. That's what comes from this import. I'm gonna just gonna call this enter. It'll take a reference to the Mario's transform so we can animate the position on the transform. And then here we can start our coroutine. Start coroutine, enter, other.transform. So we're passing, once again, other is referring to Mario. We're passing a reference to Mario's transform to our function so we can actually animate that. Now, before we actually do the animation, we need to disable Mario's normal movement. So we can get a reference to the player movements components or script, and we can disable this. All right, now we can actually do the animation. So we need to figure out what position to animate Mario to. So if he starts on top of the pipe and the enter direction is down, for example, we need to just animate him down a couple units or just one unit. So let's define a variable to indicate what this position is. Maybe I'll call this the entered position. It's just that the position we're animating to. So this will be the position of the pipe. So transform that position is the pipe's position plus that enter direction. So this will animate him in the direction you're entering. So down, for example. Now we're also gonna animate Mario's scale, which will prevent him from clipping outside of it. So just kind of shrink him just a little bit to make sure he fits properly within the pipe. And I also just think it looks better too. It just kind of helps sell the effect in my opinion. Um, but in this case, we'll kind of do the same thing, entered scale. We don't need to really calculate anything, but we're just going to kind of reduce the scale to half. So we're going to do vector 3.1 times 0.5, or, or you could divide by two, same thing. All right, from here, we can actually um, animate the position. It, this could be very similar, similar to some of the other code we've done. So for example, we wrote some code here for animating a block, uh, the, a, a coin. Very similar. We're going to write a separate function here, I enumerator. We'll call this move. Let's pass a reference to the player. Let's pass the end position we want to animate to, as well as the end scale we want to animate to. And then from here, it'll look very similar. So we get our lapse starts at zero. Let's say the duration for this animation is one second. Um, we do need this is where the function here is a little bit different because this takes a from and a to. We're just getting the two. So we need to determine what the start position is. Just, just whatever Mario's current position is. And then same thing for scale. Start scale is just whatever his current scale is. All right, let's define our while loop, which is the actual kind of foundation for the animation itself. While lapse is less than the duration. We need to calculate the percentage. We'll call this T, which is just a lapse divided by duration. Once again, this is the same as the code we've written before, so I'm kind of going through this pretty fast. Player.position equals vector3.lerp from the start position to the end position by T. So we're in interpolating. This is linear interpolation. We're linear, linearly moving Mario from one position to another based on the percentage of the animation. Same thing for scale, vector3.lerp, start scale to end scale by t. And then we update our elapsed time by how much time has elapsed since the last frame. And then we yield for one frame in order for the while loop to start over again the next frame. And finally, once the entire animation is done, we ensure that Mario's at the exact right position by just saying player.position equals end position and player.local scale equals end scale. So very similar to the code we've written before, just some minor differences as well as some an extra line of code since we're animating two properties instead of one property. But otherwise, it's all, all familiar. Uh, here we can actually call that now. So we can say yield return new weight 
for, or sorry, yield return move. We pass the player. So the, we're moving the player to the entered position and the entered scale. And that's it. Now there will be, of course, more we do here, but let's start with this and just see that it works. Uh, we do need to add the script to our prefabs. So let's go to our pipe prefab and let's add our pipe scripts. The defaults are all good. Same thing for our other one here. Let's add our pipe scripts. Now this one is different. So this one, the enter direction is right. So that would be positive one in the X axis and the enter key for me, since I'm using W, A, S, and D will be D. I'm gonna set that to D and that looks good. Um, now this one, I know the there will be an exit pipe. So I'm gonna say the exit direction is one positive. So that'd be up. Um, but otherwise, this is all good. We do need to set the, in order to test this, we do need to set a connection. So I know this pipe here is what leads to the underground section. So we need to connect that pipe to some transform in the underground. So what we can do is just go to our underground and create an empty, an empty object here. Maybe I'll call this the entrance. And let's move this. Oops, um, let's move this transform to be, I think it's like 150, like negative two. Yeah, so this transform here, this will be where Mario is transported to when he enters the pipe. So he will kind of spawn here and then and then from there fall, fall like normal. This pipe here should connect back up to the top. So I think that's this one. Yeah, so we're gonna take this pipe here. We're gonna connect those together. Um, and then the yeah, enter key is D, enter direction is right, exit direction is up, so that's all good. Um, this pipe here is the one that actually leads to the underground. So now that we created that little entrance uh, object, we can we can drag that reference to the connection. So we're connecting this pipe to the underground entrance, which is just a little empty object that sits there to represent that the position we want. We're good there. Now we haven't, once again, we haven't finished the pipe script. We haven't done like actually exiting yet, but let's at least test the initial animation of you entering. Oh, I'm bad and I forgot to jump. Let's try that again. I think it was the fourth pipe in here, if I recall. Yeah, so is this one, I believe. Okay, so I should, so I'm standing in the middle, which means I should be touching the little trigger zone. So if I press down, there we go. So Mario actually animates down. And we haven't done anything else, so nothing happens after that, but we should be able to see Mario, yeah. So we can kind of see he's kind of hiding behind the pipe. And look, he's, he's a little mini Mario because we are animating his scale. And that just ensures that he doesn't clip outside the edges. Um, so that all looks good at that point now that he's animated now we can transport him to wherever the pipe connects to um, So let's go ahead and, and keep doing that All right, let's go ahead and open our pipe script again and let's focus on the exiting So after Mario is animated inside the pipe now we can transport him to the, the connection um, I am gonna delay that by just a second though. I feel like it it feels a little bit better he kind of enters it sits there for a brief second and then it moves to the new location so i'm gonna just yield for one second here so we can say yield return new wait for seconds and pass an amount that'll just kind of pause for a second before we actually move to this new connection and now from here this is where the exit direction comes into play so like i said before sometimes you will actually exit another pipe in other cases, you will just move to a fixed point. So we should check if the exit direction is not zero. Well, that means you are exiting another pipe, for example, and we need to actually animate that in the same way that we did here, but just sort of the opposite. Instead of animating from out to in, we're gonna animate from in to out. So uh, for that, we need to just We'll just use the same move function like we did before. We just need to pass different, you know, just need to uh, pass different values. Uh, but first, we do need to still move Mario's position to this. So we can say player.position equals connection.position. 
and then we're going to subtract the exit direction. We need to do this same code here where we where we animate to animate from one position in the direction, but instead it'll be plus the exit direction. But first we need to position Mario inside the pipe. So that's going to be the opposite. So we need to do the opposite direction. We're going to animate him. Um, that way he goes inside the pipe and then we'll animate him moving out. Remember, so we're going from, in this case, we're going from in to out instead of before we are going from out to in. So we can do our move function just like we did here, but this time we are going to animate Mario to the connection position plus the exit direction. And then the scale, we just want to set him back to his normal scale. So scale will be, um, will be zero here or not zero one. All right. Now, if the exit direction is not zero or if it is zero, so that's not zero else. If it is zero, well, Mario's just connecting to a fixed point, in which case we just set the position to be the connection position and we set the scale to be one. We don't need to do any animation. And finally, we need to re-enable Mario's movement. So we just copy that line of code and change this to true. And we're good there. All right, let's test this out. Oh, it's still running, running the game the whole time. It's okay. Let's rerun this. Now, I don't think we're going to really be able to see this happening because the camera is not going to adjust, but let's look in the editor. Okay. Okay. So the camera did change, but it's not, we need to move the camera downwards. We'll get to that in a minute, but we do know we did teleport. Let's see where Mario's at in our scene. Yeah. So he's down here. So he, he started up here. You didn't, we didn't see it because you know, we, the camera's up here, but he started here because of just Mario's normal gravity and physics. He fell down to the ground. Um, and then let me, maybe temporarily, I can just move the camera down. Yeah, let's just move the, this is just temporary, but I just want to be able to be, be able to test, um, him exiting now. So we're going to enter where he enters. I'm going to move, I'm going to pause and move the camera back up so I can see the animation here. Yep. There we go. So then he came and he entered so that, or exited. So that looks perfect. So that'll all good in terms of our pipe code. This code is fully finished. Now we just need to work on the camera itself. All right, so we need a way for our camera to transition from being above ground to underground. So why don't we go ahead and go to our side scrolling script, which is something we haven't touched in a long time, but this is the script that is part of our camera objects. We have the side scrolling script, which kind of manages the position of the camera. Why don't we add a public function to this? It needs to be public because we're going to be calling this function from a different script. And why don't we say set underground? And this will, will pass a Boolean. Um, I'll go call that underground. So we're going to say set underground, which will be true or false. So set underground true or false. And that'll then update the position of the camera accordingly. So the position of the camera really it might vary based on the level. So we can define some variables here to indicate what the height of the camera is. Um, so we'll say, what is the normal height of the camera? Which, and this could vary for you. So I know for me, the values are 6.5 is the like current, like right here from this point of view, the camera is 6.5. Yeah. The Y value here, in other words, sort of the height of the camera is 6.5. That might be different for you, depending on how you constructed your level and so on. But for me, it's 6.5 is like the per perfect above ground position. We need to do the same thing for underground. So I know for me, underground, I think will be negative 9.5 and let's move the camera left. Let's move it to the right so we can check. Yeah. So in this case, um, the bottom of the underground, so yeah, it all lines up perfectly at the very top, to the very bottom. So negative 9.5 is my underground position. Once again, that might vary for you. Um, but that's what it is for me. Um, and that could also vary for levels. So in, if you have different scenes for different levels, you can still update these variables in each scene respectively. 
but let's have one for the underground height. And this will be negative 9.5. And I think that's really all we need. From here, what we can do is say, uh, we're gonna, we need to just update the camera's position. So let's get whatever the camera's current position is. But we only want to update the camera's Y position because the X position will still get updated automatically. You actually saw before that it still moved it all the way to the right. It just doesn't move. There's no code in here to move it up and down. So we have the left and right still, but we still need up and down. So that's what this is. Camera position dot Y. And we can use a ternary statement here to say if you're underground, then we'll use the underground height. Otherwise, we'll use the normal height. So this is a ternary statement. It's kind of like an if, if statement and if else statement where there's some condition. If the condition is true, it evaluates to this value. If the condition is false, it evaluates to this value. And then we just update our transform to this new position. All right, so pretty simple. From here, we need to actually call that function when we enter a pipe. But once again, I mean, in some cases, maybe one pipe just leads to another pipe and you're not actually going underground. So we can verify, we can check the position of our connection. If that is less than zero, which would imply it's underground, then we can set the um, underground. So we need to get a reference to our side scrolling script, which exists in our camera. Unity actually has a built-in way to get a reference to the main camera. So when you say camera.main, it will always refer to the camera in your scene that is tagged main camera. That should be set or tagged by default, but if yours isn't for some reason, make sure to tag your camera as main camera, assuming it is indeed the main camera. Um, to camera.main, we'll get component, get components, our side scrolling script here. And then we can say set underground. Once again, we have to say true or false. Um, bool underground equals connection.position.y is less than zero. So if the, the position we're connecting to is less than zero, so it's underground, well, that will get set to true. And we pass that in here. Otherwise, it'll be false, in which case the camera will go to the above ground position. All right, let's test this out. Make sure your values are set um, accordingly. And let's move over to the pipe here. All right, let's test this out. So we enter, there we go. And now we can see Mario fall and I can also go back in. And then, yep, and it goes above grounds. Great, that looks awesome. So there is our fully working pipes and everything. All right, so before we move on to the next section, there is a slight tangent uh, I want to make here, which is I never added coins in our underground here. So now that we can actually traverse to this underground section, why don't we add some of the coins that belong here? In the previous video, we implemented the code to actually be able to pick up certain power-ups and coins and whatnot. So we already have a prefab for our coins. We just need to actually place them in our in our scene. So I'm going to just take our coin prefab. I'm going to drag this in and let's try to get the right positions here. 152, negative 11. Um, yeah, that looks good. Now for these underground ones, they actually have a different sprite. So I can override the prefab to use this underground sprite. And yeah, now you can kind of see that a little bit better. And I'm just going to, oh, and first let me move this to underground here, just to keep things organized. And I can just duplicate this several times now, 153, 155, or 154, 155, so on, 156, 57, and one more, 158. And then there's another row, so I'm going to duplicate all of those and move them up. Negative 8, or no, this should be a negative 7.5. Yeah, something like that. I guess it doesn't really matter. And then duplicate that again. We'll make these negative 6. And then there's only, yeah, it looks like that. So that's how it normally is, I believe, in the game. Maybe the they're actually, I, I think um, these should actually be a little bit higher. 
So this should be negative seven and negative five. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. Uh, I got an error here. That was just some weird, this is just some weird Unity editor bug. That's not anything really. Um, but let's run this and see what happens here. So I should, based on what we did in the last video, I should just be able to pick these up and it works. Enter our pipe, go down, and yeah, now I can just pick up these points. Let's see that our game state is actually changing. So um, somewhere in our, somewhere in our, um, oh, is it on Mario? Yeah. Or no, there should be a game manager somewhere in our scene. Maybe, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, it, it gets marked as don't destroy. So the coin's 12, yeah. So as I pick up new coins, there we go. So it, that's all working. Sweet. All right. So just a little bit of a tangent there, but figured I now that we actually have our underground, we should actually add, add our coins there. All right, let's work on the final sequence of the game, which is where Mario grabs the flag and then goes down and into the castle. So this is really just going to be one big animation sequence that gets triggered when Mario touches the flag. So let's first just update our flag prefab with a couple minor updates and then we can write our script. So in our flag prefab, we should already have the collider and it's already been marked as a trigger, which is what we want. So as soon as Mario touches the flagpole, it'll trigger the whole se animation sequence. So make sure it has a clatter. It should be marked as a trigger. We do need to create an empty transform to or an empty game object that will represent the bottom of the pole. So a, just a position at the bottom here that we're going to animate both Mario to and the flag to. So once you touch the flag and Mario will go to the bottom here. And then from there, we will animate um, animate Mario to the right and then down and then to wherever the castle is. But we need to know this position at the bottom here. So let's create an empty object and just call this bottom. And I'm just going to position it. It should just be one unit up here. And I actually want to align it with the flag. So the flag is actually half a unit to the left. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put this half a unit to the left as well. So that's the position we're going to animate Mario to, both the Mario and the flag. So we're going to encode, you know, change the position of the flag to be here as well as Mario, same thing. And then we'll animate Mario to the right, to down, and then to wherever the castle is. Now we also need to adjust the layer on this, um, on this flagpole, on the parent object here. We need to set this to be ignore raycast as well, and just for the parent, so this object only. We did, it's the same reason for why we did it on the pipes, where the ray casts that are, that happen from the movement code are still triggered by, um, even though they're triggers, the ray cast will still detect those colliders. So we don't want that, uh, cause it'll affect Mario's movement and it actually will prevent Mario from being able to touch the flag. Um, so. Make sure we ignore raycast on this. Make sure it's a trigger. And we're good to go with the prefab itself. The castle prefab, I don't think we should need to do anything. Assuming your object is positioned kind of correctly, the origin of this object should be... Um, so if we change this to be the pivot point, yeah. So based on how I put together my castle prefab, the pivot point of the castle is right here which is the position we want to animate Mario to. If your object is not set to that, or if it's not positioned like that, then you may need to add an empty, um, an empty transform here, and we we'll call this entrance, and then just position this transform correctly at the doorway of the castle. And then we will reference this transform um, to know where to animate Mario to. But since my castle is already set up um since my castle is kind of already set up uh at the right position i don't need to add that extra transform but you may you may need to that's it for our prefabs all right so let's go ahead and write our script now so let's go ahead and create a new script called flagpole 
and let's open this up. I'm going to get rid of the boilerplate here that Unity provides and we'll start fresh. So the first thing we need to do, just like we've done in many other places, is detect when Mario actually touches the flagpole. So we'll do this using our on trigger enter 2D. And this takes a collider 2D, we'll refer to this as other. We need to verify that this other collider is Mario. So we'll compare the tag to, to the, the player. And if that's the case, we can start our final kind of animation sequence here. Now we're animating two different things, really. We're animating the flag itself and Mario. So we're gonna start two separate coroutines for each of those, uh, but we'll be able to reuse some code between them. Uh, we do need to get some references to some of those transforms and whatnot we added. So let's establish some public variables here. One for the flag itself. Uh, one for the bottom of the pole, so we'll call this pole bottom, and one for the castle entrance. I'll just call that castle. And I will also define a variable for speed. Now I'm gonna default this to six, but the exact value doesn't necessarily matter. For these animations, we're going to do them with, they're gonna be speed-based instead of time-based. In a lot of the other animations we've done, we animate something from one point to another point over a fixed set of time. This is di different. That doesn't work very well for this because depending on where Mario touches the flagpole, the distance to the bottom will be more or less. But if the time is always the same, then it's gonna change this, the how quickly that animation happens. If you touch the very bottom and we only need to animate to the very bottom, and it's a two second animation well then it's going to be this like super slow-mo like you're going to watch it's going to look really stupid when you're sitting there for two seconds waiting for mario to go from here to here you know like it it may would make sense if he's at the very top and he has to go to the bottom that's where it we can't really define this with time because we don't know like it's going to vary so instead we define it based on speed he will always m animate at the same speed so it, the distances, whether the castle's, you know, over here, um, it, it'll always look the same. Um, it might take more or less time depending on how far something is, but it will feel consistent, which is the important part. So that's what that speed property is for. Six, once again, it's, it's just an arbitrary value, but six from my testing seems to work very well. For our animations, we are going to still use coroutines like we have been, so we'll import system.collections. And let's define a couple different coroutines here. One we'll call level complete sequence. So this will be for Mario. Um, this will really be for Mario's full animation sequence. So we're going to pass a transform to Mario's transform here. And let's also write another one for, this will just be a more of a general purpose one to say like move to. So we're gonna move some subjects. Um, so that will either be Mario or the flag. And we're gonna move that to some position. So I'll just call that two. So move to, or I'll call this position. So move some subject to this position. And we'll use this for, for a bunch of things. So as an example here, we'll start with the flag because that one's simple. We'll start a coroutine. We'll say move to flag. So we're moving the flag to pole bottom dot position. So that's it. So that's all we have to do for the flag. Now, obviously we haven't written this, what the logic looks like yet, but that's the idea is we'll start an animation to move the flag to the bottom of the pole. Mario is a little bit more complicated because he has a sequence of First, he has to move the bottom. Then he needs to move to the right one unit, which will kind of put him on the edge of the block. Then we'll move him to the right one unit again and down, which will put him on the ground. And then we'll move him to the castle. So there'll be actually four different steps he'll take for the full sequence. Um, so that's why we kind of define this as a level complete sequence, but we can at least start this level complete sequence and we'll pass Mario's transform here other dot other is referring to Mario, so we're passing Mario's transform so we can animate the position. Now for move to, um, this is our kind of our main function that handles the logic. 
So this, like I said, it's not going to look like some of the other animation code we've written because we're doing it based on speed. So we just need to move the subject towards this position over time. And however long that takes is how long it takes based on the speed. So we need to check. So we're still gonna have a while loop. So we're gonna continue to loop while, mar while the subject is not at the destination yet. But we need to know when they reach the destination. Now we could compare, we could say while subject at position does not equal the position. Maybe I'll, I'm gonna rename this to destination just to make it a little bit more clear. So while the subject's position is not at the destination, we need to continue animating. However, this doesn't really work very well in practice because these values would need to be exactly precisely the same in order for this to finish. So instead, what we can do is we do a distance check from the position of the subject to the destination. And if that distance is really small, um, then we know they're basically at the destination. They've, you know, they've reached the destination. So we can say vector three dot distance between the subject's position and the destination is, let's say, um, as long, if it's greater than maybe a eighth of a unit, um, an eighth of a unit, then they're still too far away. They've they've not reached the destination yet. Um, so in which case we'll continue animating. So while they're far, far away from the destination, we will update their position. Now we can't lerp. We can't say lerp because lerp, you have to know what's the start position, what's the end position. Here, we're just going to say vector three that move towards. So we're just moving the subject towards the destination over time. Um, so we need to pass the current position. That's just where the subject's current position is. And then the destination here. And then the max distance delta is sort of just the speed, really. It's how much can they move in a single frame? And that's just what the speed is. Multiplied by time dot delta time. Because this is, we are moving them over time. So we multiply by time and based on the speed. And then we just yield for a frame that way it'll start over it'll, the next frame it'll check again hey have i reached the destination oh nope i haven't yet i'll continue moving towards um, moving towards the destination once the whole thing is finished so once we've basically reached the destination we won't be exactly at the destination but we'll be pretty close we can just set the position to be the destination so that's it for this code in some ways it's maybe simpler than some of the other animation code we've written um, maybe it's more complicated, but it's certainly less code to write than some of our other animation code. Um, but now for Mario's kind of sequence here, uh, we're just going to call move to a bunch of times. We're going to move to pole bottom, move to the right, move down, then move to the castle. First, though, we do need to disable Mario's movement. So we can say get component player movements um, dot enabled equals false. So we disable Mario's normal movement here, and then we can yield return move to. So we're gonna move Mario to first the pole bottom position. Then we will move him one unit to the right. So we'll take whatever Mario's current position is plus vector three dot right. Then we need to move him to the right again, but also down. Also, I made a typo here, player, lowercase. Um, so we're gonna take his current position again move them to the right one more unit and one unit down so this will put them on the ground and then finally we can now just move him to wherever the castle position is which should be the entrance the doorway to the castle so that's where whatever transform you reference here whatever you assign in the editor should be the the doorway the entrance way to the castle now, once Mario has reached the castle position, they've, they're, they enter the castle. So Mario needs to sort of like disappear. So we can just completely turn off Mario's game object. And then from there afterwards, we'll trigger the next level, but we'll come back to that last. Um, but this is good. Is there, let me, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to do. Um, I don't think so. Why don't we just test it out and see what happens? Let me go and we do need to add our script to our flagpole here. So let's open our prefab. Let's add our flagpole script. 
and we can assign some of these references. We assign the pole bottom reference. We assign the flag reference. We can't reference the castle in the prefab because it's just the flagpole. But in our scene, we have to make sure we assign our castle reference there. All right, let's test this out. Uh, I am going to move Mario. I'm going to move Mario. Um, I'm just going to cheat and move Mario over here so we can test this a little bit quicker. And did we? Um, yeah. Okay, so I should be able to touch the flagpole. There we go. So let's slow this down again. Or let me try this again. I'm going to pause it. So one, I so I touch the flagpole. And then from here, you can see the flag is animating down as well as Mario. Mario hits the bottom. Then we move one unit to the right. Once he's one unit to the right, now we move him one unit to the right in again and one unit down. So he's actually going at a diagonal now. And then once he's on the ground, we move him to the castle. And then he disappears because he enters. So that all looks good. Now, one thing that does maybe not look good is his sprites is kind of weird. What we probably should do, and that's because we disable his movement, but the his velocity doesn't get cleared out. So it still thinks his velocity is higher. So he still is like stuck in his like either jump or um, or like run animation. Um, so one thing we never did is in our in our player movement script, we should write some code to um, you know, when this code or when this script gets disabled to clear out the velocity and things like that. Make sure the state gets reset back. Um, so I'm just going to add right after our wake function here on disable. And we actually probably should do the, op the opposite too. So we should do probably both on enable and on disable. Let's start with on disable though. For one, uh, I don't know why we never did this before. I guess it doesn't really matter, but let's make make sure Mario's kinematic so you really can't move or anything. Let's make sure we turn off the collider um, as well. Oh, I don't have a reference to the collider. Let's get a reference to the collider. Private new collider 2D collider. I'm using the new keyword to suppress the warning that comes from using the same name as some deprecated value in the base class. Uh, you can also just call it something else, but I don't like to do that personally, just my preference. All right, so we have a reference to our collider. Let's turn off our collider. But really, these are probably things we should have done a long time ago, but I guess they never really mattered. But if they did and we just never caught it, they at least it's in here now. But this is kind of the important thing here is the velocity will get set to zero. Um, and then we probably should set jumping to false as well. Um, cool. And then really on, on enable is kind of doing the opposite. So we need to reset it to not be kinematic anymore. We need to re-enable the collider and we'll still set the velocity to be zero as well. And maybe jumping to be false as well. Okay, so that looks good. So in theory, Mario's sprite should not be weird anymore when we are on the flagpole. Yeah, there we go. So that looks better. Because before he was like stuck in his, um, he was stuck in his uh, jump sprite, which didn't look very good. Now I know technically there is like a grab. I think there actually is like a grab sprite, but I don't have that. I don't believe I do. So I, I would encourage you if you really care, um, you know, set manually set Mario's sprite to be like the flagpole grab sprite, but then you also need to change it again once he's moving on the ground. So that's where the way this is now, this works pretty well because it, it still plays the run animation while he's moving on the ground, which feels correct. It just is missing kind of the grab. Um, but to be honest, for me, it's not a big deal. Um, and it's very kind of inconvenient to implement that. So challenge you to do that. But for me, this is totally, I'm totally happy with this. 
Um, yeah, is there anything else we're missing? Let me just do it one last time and see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, that looks good. Mario disappears. Yeah, and that's it. And then from there, we'll just trigger the next level, which we'll do next. Let me just reset Mario's position back to the normal. Well, I guess we'll keep it because we're gonna we still need to test more, but that's good for now. All right, last up is simply loading the next level once Mario has entered the castle. So let's go back to our flagpole scripts where we do the level complete sequence. And here after Mario has entered the castle, so we turn off Mario's to kind of, he disappears in a sense, makes it look like he entered the castle. Let's yield for, you know, maybe two seconds before we actually start the next level. You can feel free to customize that, but I'm going to kind of just pause for a second or two, maybe two, three seconds, and then we'll trigger the next level. So we already have our game manager set up. We say game manager instance dot load level. Well, it looks like this is not public. So let's make our load level function a public function. And we can say dot load level. Now we need to know what world and what stage we want to load. And this will obviously be different for each level. Now I believe, yeah, we did actually add a next level function. The problem with this is it kind of assumes like you, you just increment the stage and then the world, but it doesn't, how do you know, like when do you go to the next world? Um, so I actually don't really like this solution. I don't think we're using this anywhere. So in theory, we could just get rid of this. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some variables here to indicate what what the next world is. And I'll maybe I'll just default that to one and what the next stage is. And I'll also just default that to one. Now that way, it's at least something. Um, but so for each of your levels, you can go in, you can update these to say, OK, well, this flagpole and then, you know, this will lead to to, you know, this will lead to one dash two and one dash three and then two dash two dash one and so on. You can just set what the next level should be in the editor for that given um, flag. Um, so here we'll just say next uh, next world and then next stage. And that's literally it in terms of loading the next level. Um, all the work for this was already done when we set up our game manager a while back. So. Um, all I'll do is maybe I'll set this to say, you know, let's say one dash two will be the next, the next one. And we go in, there you go. Now I'm going to get an error here. Yeah. So I just got an error because I don't have another scene created, but in theory, like, so let's say in theory, let's, if I were to duplicate this and I did have a one dash two, um, let's, let's set Mario's position back. So in one, yeah. That obviously this would normally be a different level, but let's just play this. And I know this is, I'm kind of faking this, so it all looks weird, but. Um, boom, takes a second, boom, it loads. Oh, so I still got an error. And that's because um, even though I have the scene for it, I need to go to my build settings. So go to edits uh, or you know file build settings. And right now I've only added the one scene to my build. So I need to add both scenes. So I can drag that other scene in. And now I should be able to properly load that scene. Let's test one more time. Takes a second, two seconds. There we go. And so it obviously this is still the same level. Well, it's a different scene. I haven't updated the level, but it's one dash two. You can see in the top here is one dash two. So in theory, if Obviously, you design a different level, you would, you know, you'd be playing in that level now. And then same thing for that, for 1-2, I can go in there and I can say, okay, well, the next one's 1-3 and so on. So for however many levels you want to add, however many worlds you have, you can just freely kind of set those how you want. And that's it. I mean, that that is our Mario tutorial. Um, obviously, there's still much more to the game. It's a very large game with a lot of different features and mechanics um, but in terms of this tutorial series i think this is where i'm going to end um, if you have more suggestions for other things you would like to see from our mario game here let me know maybe i will consider doing another video 
Um, I know people have already asked about bosses and UI and things like that. Um, but it's already, I think this tutorial series as a whole now is four or five hours long. So there's a lot of content here in terms of implementing this game. And to be honest, I'm kind of just looking to move on to new things, but I definitely encourage you all to continue to build on this further. My tutorials are never meant to be like 100% perfect replications of the original game. They're just establishing a foundation you can work off of, um, trying to implement, learning how to implement different features and mechanics, uh, you know, learning different techniques that you can then implement in your own games, or you can use to further expand upon these games. Um, so yeah, try to, on your own, add, bo add a boss, add more stages, you know, add more mechanics to those new stages, add the UI, get the UI in place. Um, but for now, farewell. Thank you for watching, especially if you've watched the entire video series. I really appreciate it. So thank you. I really appreciate you watching this tutorial and I hope you learned a thing or two along the way. Give the video a thumbs up or down to let me know how I did. Subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one and leave a comment recommending what you would like to see next. If you want to support my work even more, you can become a Patreon member to receive exclusive benefits, including access to the unique assets that I develop. Link in the description of the video. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.